Yeah. Oh. It's sure there's no. That's what happens when you throw it in your bag and it gets all tangled up and. Alrighty, very special edition of Future Squared. This is episode number 342 and it is the first live Facebook live video episode of Future Squared after three and a half years. So today I have a very special guest on the couch with me here at Future Squared HQ, Mr. Lucas Aoun from Ergogenic Health. Welcome to the show, my man. Thank you, Steve. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. Have you had your nootropics this morning? Oh, yep. I'm feeling sharp, yeah. feeling focused. What, what yeah. were your uh, nootropics of choice today? Oh, today I kept it quite simple. Just stayed with um, one of my favorites at the moment is artichoke extract. Combine that with a few other herbal constituents, which seem to help me with like concentration and energy and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure we'll have time to deep dive into a lot of these nootropics today and how we can leverage them to optimize our performance in all facets of life. But um, before we go any further, um, you've obviously hinted as to what you do, but if I met you in an elevator and I had 30 seconds to chat with you and I asked you, hey man, what's your story? What are you all about? What do you say? Well, I guess um, people can look at me as someone who is focused on the performance model and not so much of a a sickness care, like a disease state model. Mm -hmm. I'm focusing on like, how can someone who's good become like 10% better at whatever they do? And a lot of that's catered towards like athletes and sports performance. Um, And I'm a big, big advocate for self-experimentation and, you know, like helping people become like more aware of their Mm -hmm. own physiology and mental function. So, yeah. And I guess that is key really becoming more aware because if you don't know what your baseline is, you have nothing to really measure yourself against and yeah. it seems to me that a lot of people don't even know what their general markers are when mm. it comes to uh you know their health essentially mm. yeah pretty much and a lot of people well when we come when it comes to like exploring nootropics which are basically for people who are unfamiliar with what nootropics are they're just any sort of natural or synthetic compound that can improve either any aspect of executive functioning so mm-hmm. like mood focus concentration memory um and a lot of them are designed for long-term neuroprotection Mm -hmm. so um it's becoming a pretty popular space like in silicon valley it's been yeah been around for a while it's been huge i think um tim ferris got got the wheels rolling a few years ago when he went down the whole modafinil rabbit hole and since then it's just blossomed into so much more i think the global cognitive enhancement market nowadays is worth about two billion us dollars and uh i think the other research houses who released a report saying that by 2024 would be worth closer to 10 billion us dollars which might not sound like a lot compared to some trillion dollar industries but we're talking about nootropics here which has come from nowhere so Mm. i think uh that reflects a growing interest in self-optimization that we see on a lot of different podcasts as well um you know obviously your ben greenfields of the world have spoken ad nauseum about this topic for a number of years now um but i guess to bring it back to your title if we will uh as essentially a naturopath right yeah um so define that for us okay so i mean i'm not sure about like how many of your audience would be aware of what a naturopath is but essentially we are fixated on healing the body and restoring balance through um, factors simply beyond just a a medication right Mm. so we understand that like for someone to become to reach their fullest potential they have to address various factors of their lifestyle so sleep diet stress management um, exercise things like that they all play a role in um ultimate well-being so yeah i mean and and naturopaths really focus on you know the overall the bigger picture yeah it's just um a lot of people get a bit frustrated with um some of the other forms of medicine where it's focused on simply um symptom suppression which Mm. in the long run it may like it just leads to more issues down the track so you'd rather we focus on the cause yeah like the root cause of disease or or um, the symptoms and then we address that. Mm-hmm. 
So I guess with uh, respect to what you're saying there with modern medicine, essentially focusing on the symptom, is that, I mean, my the way I read that is that that's essentially a band-aid solution rather than f- addressing the, the underlying root cause. Mm-hmm. And one thing you've talked about there, which I think when I observe a lot of what's going on in the nootropics and cognitive enhancement community, it seems like there's a lot of people who focus on the 1% better improvements, take this pill, get a little bit better, take that pill, get a little bit better, but then they will neglect. For example, in the entrepreneurial community, people will beat their chests and say, I'm working 14 hour days and they'll have lion's mane and um, emulsified MCT oil and all sorts of stuff at their (laughs) desk. But they'll sit on their butts all day. They won't go to the gym. They'll get like four to five hours sleep, but they think that if they t- keep taking these supplements, that'll be enough. Is that, is that enough? Uh, it's <laughs> definitely a long game. That's not gonna, that's not gonna work out. Yeah. Like if you, want, if you want solid productivity on a daily basis, like a good, you know, like get into flow for four hours and then mm-hmm. just have like a, a solid day throughout like the rest of the day, then you gotta, look at it beyond simply utilizing these little short-term nootropics and thinking about it as a as a bigger as a bigger picture yeah Yeah. so the way i i think it was alex hutchinson who i had this conversation with um he wrote the book endure used to write for runners world and his analogy was you know all that stuff's great but unless you're getting your seven to eight hours sleep unless you're exercising regularly and eating well most of the time it's kind of like having the icing without the cake mm, yeah pretty yeah. much yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny i wanted to uh rewind about three or four years i think one of my first memories of lucas was uh when i was an advisor at a company called newts um, which changed its name to happy basically a melbourne-based nootropics company you worked for them mm. for a little while and uh, i remember you sitting in one of the the meeting rooms at Collective Campus with um, a brainwave reader on your head and you were <laughs> meditating and there was like a group of people around you looking at the brainwaves on the computer trying to determine whether there was a correlation between the meditation and which brainwave you were in and um, I was like, man, that is some next level shit. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that day actually. Um, I think I was uh, just a guinea pig for a, for a student experiment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. But and that's the thing. It's um being a guinea pig, I think is something that uh whether it's a Bren, Ben Greenfield or a Tim Ferriss or someone like that and and yourself, you're always running these new experiments and I see your updates whether it's on Instagram or Facebook. This week I'm trying this, this week I'm trying that. The effect on my cognition was probably worse than I would have liked. I remember reading something like that based on something you tried and mm. i mean what does that sort of cadence of experiment look like for you are you running experiments every week or yeah. well i've actually noticed that in the last few months i follow a very um similar s- procedure and what i do is i will first start out with just research like mm-hmm. understanding the theory behind mm. a substance or a particular herb or something if i'm trying to a particular supplement or whatever so i'll do the preliminary research mm understand the science like really go deep and like i really like don't even go on to particular any websites that are biased or anything i just go straight to like the pubmed source and try and understand let's say we're talking about a herb right i'll mm-hmm. understand its therapeutic action so like what it's what it's atten- intending to achieve and then i'll look at it from a like a traditional point of view as well so like understanding how it was used a thousand years like thousands of years ago yeah um and then i'll uh I'll, I'll dive deep and then i'll just experiment with it like i'll source it myself and then see how it affects how it affect, how it affects me and then i'll um i'll document everything as well so mm. like i'll keep track of um how things are affecting me in particular ways um and that comes back to that self-awareness at, at the start because without that I can't measure change and like mm. I can't see what's working for me and that's something I always encourage people to do is to first like understand your baseline yeah so then you can really understand what else is is affecting you sort of thing yeah so like yeah it's just been a it's something <laughs> I've become very addicted to and yeah. um, it's really empowering like it's really fun when you're able to um, 
when you read something it's one thing but to experiment experience something mm. that's another thing and mm. like i remember the experiences i don't always remember the theory but it's the, the experiences is what that is what matters to me yeah yeah mm. and that's the same as trying to learn anything like you can read about it you can watch youtube videos but you're probably not going to remember it unless you actually experience it. Mm. Like whether it's trying stand-up comedy, learning how to surf, riding a motorcycle, all of these things that I've personally experienced in the past year and a half or so. Um, if I just read about them in the book, uh, one, I wouldn't be able to do them. And two, the memories and experiences that come with that wouldn't be anywhere near as strong. But for someone who's listening to this, they're like, wow, this guy sounds a bit loopy. He's like... <laughs> Yeah, uh, sourcing all these products from all over the world, running all these experiments and whatnot. I mean, what enamored you by this space in the first place? Like, what got you into it in the first place? Um, well, I I used to play soccer for a long time, mm-hmm. so that sort of triggered, that sort of catapulted me into experimenting with compounds that could improve my performance on the soccer field. Yeah. So, like physical performance, but also like decision making and like ability to tolerate stress. Yeah. It was a big one. And I read that you tried a number of different supplements and you found that your reaction time on the pitch improved. Yeah, there was a particular one called um, acetyl L-carnitine, which is basically a, um, an amino acid that can cross the brain, so mm-hmm. the blood-brain barrier. Um, and it basically ramps up a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, yep. which is um, very important for like uh, memory, focus, and... Even the ability for like to send signals from the brain to your muscles to contract and stuff like that. So oh. um, that was a pretty that was a pretty powerful nootropic for me back mm-hmm. in the day. Um, and then from there, it just sort of escalated, and um, I started looking at other ways to unlock performance in other areas of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, I understand. A few years ago, you also had some health issues, which kind of um, amplified your interest in this space. Yeah, and it's quite funny though. Like at my university now, a lot of other students that are studying also have had a, a history of health issues, and they've yeah. been quote unquote fed up with the current medical system, and yeah. they've um, wanted to address the root cause. So for me, I struggled with um, acid reflux, like mm-hmm. heartburn for a number of years and i mean my my father's a pharmacist and um i was i was put on a particular medication for that and um i realized that that was not addressing the root cause and in fact it was simply a band-aid and what i would do was i would use that medication and then just think that i could eat whatever i wanted Mm. and so like i could just smash a lot of junk food and just be like I'm fine. I'm like good. I've got this. Yeah, yeah, I'm covered. It's like when people pop a multivitamin and then go to McDonald's for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> uh, that makes sense. Um, no, and, and I think that I can draw parallels between that and what I see a lot of entrepreneurs do. You know, they'll get into a particular space trying to solve a particular problem because they have experienced it themselves, uh, whether it was, you know, Drew Houston uh, who found a Dropbox and his whole thing was he got tired of losing thumb drives with important files on them and things like that and having to back stuff up onto external hard drives and clunky. I remember actually losing an external hard drive that I spent hundreds of hours ripping CDs onto. This was about 10 years ago. I'm showing my age. And then we left it out in the sun at a New Year's Eve party and it just fried. And that was not a good experience. So I'm definitely glad that we have online storage and and the likes of Spotify nowadays. But I think it speaks volumes to you know, the the impetus to want to try something, to create something, to solve a problem when you've experienced it firsthand. Mm. And then when you do try something like you did on the soccer pitch and you notice these improvements like that is very motivating and it just pushes you to keep going down this rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love the aspect of, um, I also love the aspect that it's a very unexplored area as well. Mm. Like, and not many athletes really tap into that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I see that as a growth area myself. And clearly that's a space I want to sort of Mm. occupy. Are you starting to see more professional athletes tap into this sort of stuff? You know, I'm not actually entirely sure, but I know like a lot of UFC fighters and um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighters, some friends of mine, they really looking for things that can improve like focus Mm -hmm. when they fight. Um, I had, I worked with a table tennis player at one stage. He's, um, 
he was looking for obviously something that would help him with focus and like yeah, I imagine that's one sport where you need to be super honed in yeah yeah um, it's not like cricket where you can just be an outfielder and just you know scratch your bum yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so I guess and even bodybuilders now I think what, what, what we're seeing is um, a lot of products are now using nootropics yeah. in their pre-workouts yeah uh, because they know that they do have a pretty robust effect on brain function yeah yeah um i guess with um focus and especially amongst mixed martial artists i guess in that industry you've got a bunch of evangelists uh if you will who are pushing the merits of nootropics whether it is the likes of um uh aubrey marcus or joe rogan over at on it and you know the alpha brain supplement i think that's gained a lot of uh, notoriety, if you will, within the mixed martial arts circle. Mm. Um, and perhaps what you might see is that there might be other advocates uh, within other sports that might, you know, start to push the the cause somewhat. But yeah, it's definitely taken off within mm. MMA. And even the, um, the e-gaming market as well. Yeah. That's taking off there as well. Like a lot of, uh, gamers, like professional gamers, mm. they want things that can improve their reaction time and like um, other aspects of... I'm not exactly... I don't play video games myself. Yeah, neither uh, do I. <laughs> well, the only time I play video games is when I visit my uh, one of my nephews and he always asks me to play FIFA. Yeah. And he's like, this time I'm going to beat you. And uh, he almost does. But then I always come back with two late goals and, and beat him 3-2, three, three, which is... Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't agree. And I'm not one of these guys who believes in letting them win because that way they never learn and you're not setting them up for success in the real world right they've got to they've got to struggle against adversity and then win the right way um so speaking of evangelists in the field and advocates uh, you did some work with uh anthony d clementi who is uh you know one of the world's leading sort of holistic wellness uh advocates or coaches if you will he wrote a book called uh was it the ultimate uh got the name here the biohackers guide to upgraded energy and focus mm. um what did you do with um anthony what was the nature of that work yeah so when i was working with anthony we were focusing on that di- the digestive issues and mm-hmm. um essentially he put me onto an el- uh, an elimination diet to basically see which sort of foods i was reacting to mm-hmm. um he also implemented some other like sleep hacks so the blue blockers yeah, back in the day, um, and I'm not sure if your audience is pretty aware of them. Yeah, but, let's but talk about blue blockers. I've got some in my bag at the moment. Yeah, so essentially, um, all they are is just glasses which um, you put on about two to three hours before bed, and um, they filter out all the blue light. Um, and so, essentially, all you can see. Is mm-hmm. um, and what that does is with artificial blue light, it essentially when your eyes are exposed to that sort of light. Um, that suppresses our sleep hormone, melatonin. Um, and I actually did some self-experimentation myself with uh, with my aura ring, mm-hmm. which tracks my sleep. And um, I did nights with and without my blue blockers. And on the nights that I did wear my blue blockers, there was about a 20 to 30% increase in my deep sleep. Wow. Which is enough because if you think about the repercussions of that, the following day, your your energy levels will be a lot better mm-hmm. based off just that deep sp- deep sleep aspect. Yeah, um, yeah. Energy, I think, mood regulation. So you generally be a more positive person, mm. uh, and also creativity as well. Yeah. I think it's in that deep REM sleep where um, our brain starts to make connections between different learning pathways or neurons that we have. Yeah. Uh, you know, gathered over the day or, or the month or the or the years mm. so yeah that's fantastic um and just for our listeners if they are looking for some blue light glasses i picked them up on key australia no i am not sponsored by them but uh it was like 60 bucks or so and you know if, if you can get a 30 percent increase on your REM sleep that's that's a very <laughs> worthwhile investment for sure yeah yeah, so... Um, Although I would also say, just before we go on, sorry, Lucas, that people should probably just not look at their phones for an hour or so before they go to bed anyways <laughs> yeah. and do something a little bit more calming. Mm, such as read a book or something. Yes. Um, yeah, so with Anthony, we sort of... He sort of exposed me to other areas of wellness that I wasn't even sort of tapping into. Mm-hmm. And um, 
one of them, funnily enough, he sort of knew that I was one of those guys who just loves to consume, 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 like information. Yeah. yeah. And he basically hinted to me that I need to stop consuming and start just living and loving myself sort of thing and just, yeah. you know, being grateful with where I'm at and like all that I've achieved. Um, so, I'm still working on that today. Like mm. I haven't, I'm not, I haven't perfected that area. Like I think I'm always, like all my friends around me and family, they all know that I'm always on the hunt for the next something big. And mm. I've said this to a lot of people is that I wake up, I do wake up every single day with a, with like a flame. Like I can't even, it's a, a sensation that I have that I'm going to discover something big yeah. for science. I don't know what it is yet, but it's going to be, it's going to be life-changing for millions of people. I can, I can feel it, whether that's a nootropic or if it's some sort of health yeah. manipulating thing. I have no idea, but yeah, I'm just, it's that's, motivating for sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And I, I don't really meet too many people who tell me that they wake up in the morning with this flame, this burning <laughs> desire to discover this breakthrough in, in medicine, in science. It's going to change people's lives. I think that's really cool. Um, and, you know, I totally hear you when you say a desire to want to just consume, consume, consume. Um, and sometimes that can come at the expense of, say, taking action. Um, and, you know, you could have, say, for example, two entrepreneurs. One just loves reading everything, every book, read all the books, listen to all the podcasts, um, read all the blogs and have all this knowledge. But not really act on it whereas you might have another entrepreneur who will just go forward and act make a million mistakes along the way because he hasn't read these blogs and books but then learn pick themselves up you know what do they say pull pull yourself up by your bootstraps keep moving forward and over the course of say a year or two the person who didn't do any of the reading might actually be in a much more advantageous position mm. but having said all of that we're talking about two extreme cases here i think the ground in the middle is essentially where you want to be where you do stand on the shoulders of giants you do read enough books you do speak to enough people but then you also take action yeah but you basically one side or the other side of the spectrum is probably not the best place to be if you want to get good results in a shorter amount of time mm. yeah i mean i i'm not sure have you found yourself sort of operating in in one space and then flicking straight back into the other or uh i, I think for a, for a long time I was probably in that space of consumption. Mm. This was going back many years, whereas now um, I am a big advocate of rapid experimentation. So I will read something or learn something. I will then put it into a backlog of ideas that I have. I'll prioritize that by how likely is this going to be to create value and what's the cost going to be of this out of 10, so for time and money. And then based on value divided by cost, you get a, a, a value. And then I will say, okay, how can I run an experiment to see whether or not this is actually going to work? And then it's about putting what you learned into action as quickly as you possibly can with a very low fidelity version. And then, hey, if it works, if we get some positive metrics, maybe ramp it up. If it doesn't, maybe ramp it down, uh, kill it potentially. But that way, by... Uh, testing as fast as you possibly can you get out of that analysis paralysis place but it also means you avoid just doing stuff without having sort of leveraged the the content that's out there because if i'm going to operate purely based on experience then I'm, I'm basing it on one person's experience of life of, of learnings but if you're reading books and everything else then you can be operating upon thousands of people have done before you learn from their lessons mm -hmm. learn from their successes um, and you're going to be much more likely to succeed but it is about being intentional in, and I'm sure you're the same way with your experimentation where you're very diligent you know what your markers are your base <laughs> testing what your hypothesis is how long you're going to run it for what success looks like and, and so on yeah Pretty much, yeah, spot on. Yeah, and um, I mean, speaking of which, and um, this is perhaps where the males uh, listening to this, and maybe even the females who are, who are, you know, are partnered up might want to take take heed. Uh, when it came to um, testing and running experiments of your own, I remember you posting something on, uh, I think it was on Facebook, probably about a year ago, where you posted your testosterone levels, and your testosterone levels were had basically maxed out. I think at what thirty 
What's the what's the rank? What's the, the marker? The range goes up to twenty eight. Twenty eight. Twenty seven point three. You're twenty seven point three. And before you started this experiment, what were you on? Okay, so um, <laughs> I think I know what Steve's hinting at right now. But um, the intention of that that experiment was to see the effects of icing. Yes. What do we mean by? Are we putting like an ice pack on our heads, or what's what's the go here? <laughs> okay, so the theory is that men's testicles yes. their gonads um, they need to be kept cool for uh-huh. optimal function right and just in our everyday living like they're always because even if they're just two degrees too hot mm-hmm. or too warm they um, fail to produce sperm and like they the function of the gonads no longer work so yeah. um, I did a bit of reading online I did some research and I came across a particular cooling device mm-hmm. and I read some studies on that and how that improved um, overall sperm function and fertility in men. Um, then I did a bit more research and then I decided to just start experimenting with it and um, started an icing protocol of literally just like 10 minutes a night before yep. bed. and um, For how long? Uh, I did that for about 12 weeks yep. and then got the blood test done. Um, having said that though, like beforehand, my hormones were, were pretty good, but it did it did boost me up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and funnily enough, I decided to create a, a Facebook group dedicated to this and then... It was called Sub-Zero, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, Sub-Zero. <laughs> and you can ask any guy in the group and they love, they love the practice and they do it before the gym and yeah. before all, all sorts of things and yeah they love it yeah no and um you know i won't speak at length about my own experiences but it (laughs) is um definitely worth exploring if you're a a male listening to this uh it it does have a marked does demonstrate market increase in your in your virility if i if i will use that word um Moving right along, moving right along. So we've talked, we've kind of uh, skated around the subject and this is time for a red button question, um, which is what the, the the two Adams from the What You Will Learn podcast, that's, the, that's their terminology. But basically we've skated around the topic of modern healthcare and how we feel, or you feel rather that it's broken in some ways, um, that maybe it only addresses the symptoms, not the root cause, um, and that the naturopath approach is a little bit more holistic and and gets to the root cause of things um at the same time um you know if you go on the interwebs there's a lot of uh, criticism of naturopathy in the sense that some people think it's kind of antagonistic to uh, science if you will um and some call it a pseudoscience now i'm sure you've thought about this and i'd love to know what your take on it is mm. well let's just say that i'm before we commence on this topic is yeah. that i'm not a hundred i'm not fully against western medicine yeah and like i totally understand that it's necessary mm-hmm. um for acute conditions and like if you've you know broken your leg don't go see a naturopath yeah. go to go go to the end so we're all, we're all for vaccines of course <laughs> <laughs> um but essentially with longer term like chronic conditions where like people with gut issues or sort of arthritis or um asthma or allergies and things like that a naturopath will aim to they will take a very like instead of just spending say like five minutes you go to your your gp and they'll Mm. they'll say they'll talk to you i'm not sure how much they'll listen but um they will essentially want to prescribe you with something that will just dampen the symptoms Mm. but a naturopath will dive very deep and we'll spend like a good hour and a half on a patient, understand their health history, and we'll try and uncover where the source of the the problem starts. Yeah. And we understand that it's very individualized as well. So like um, we do run bio, like we do run biomarkers as well. Like mm-hmm. we do we can order blood tests for patients. Um, but essentially, and the other key thing is a lot of people you may get a blood test with your doctor and your results come back within the normal range, Mm -hmm. right? But that normal range is based on the population. Yeah. And um, for example, with thyroid function, um, 
some people can be smack bang in the middle of the range and the doctor will say awesome you're you're perfect like you're in you're in good health your thyroid's perfect um but if you really dive deeper and understand the negative feedback mechanisms of what that's actually measuring that's not optimal like Mm. we want you do you want to feel great or do you want to just feel like average yeah if the average is representative of the person who doesn't exercise, eats a lot of McDonald's and everything else, and your average is not exactly a good thing. Mm, yeah, pretty much. So um, th- that's that's one aspect. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, a naturopath will, will. We we do focus on the gut a lot because mm-hmm. we understand that, like, there's a quote: uh, obviously, all disease begins in the gut. Yeah, um, and we're starting to learn more about how far reaching our microbiome is for yeah. these sorts of things. Yeah, well, I just um, finished reading a book, which is here, incidentally, awesome. called uh, The Mind-Gut Connection by um, Emma and Mayer. Uh, it was quite an eye-opener for me. And mm. apparently a lot of the... Well, obviously, the, 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 the microbiome, in a way, is kind of like your second brain in the sense that uh, in terms of the traffic that gets sent from your brain to your gut and back, 90% of it goes from your gut to your brain and only 10% goes yeah. from your brain to your gut. And mm. apparently a lot of this goes back to infancy and even you know when we're born and the um, you know bacteria and everything as we come out of our mother's vagina essentially. Um, and that can then have lifelong impacts on health as well as your... Uh, disposition in terms of your mood as well like are mm. you going to be someone who suffers from social anxiety and all sorts of stuff like a, I was blown away by some of the learnings and I'm only like scratching the, the very you know, top of the surface here yeah. in terms of the microbiome but I guess it's still early days in terms of what we're what we know in that space yeah yeah well um, I'm sure a lot of your audience will be familiar with probiotics yes of course um, so there's a whole new space that's like there's a lot of research going into it and that's psychobiotics right so they're essentially uh uh, probiotics which can which have a significant effect on mental health so like depression anxiety Mm. and things like that and that's a really that's a cool space and i'm always like delving into it and stuff so just keep a lookout keep a look at that sort of stuff yeah and uh i was reading about that in the sense that if you eat uh, you know, probiotic enriched um, yogurt or, or pop, you know, your 55 billion um, um, probiotics and whatnot that it can have in your your mood, for example, somewhat. Um, but if you're not getting, if you haven't got a lot of diversity in your gut, then you can be quite uh, anxious and irritable and everything else that comes with it. But mm-hmm. one of the interesting studies that came out of that book as well, Oh, well, didn't come out of the book, but it was highlighted in the book was um, where they took stool samples from mice. So there'd be two mice. One would be like super um, active and social and the other one would be very reserved and quiet. And they took a stool sample from the, uh, the hyperactive mice and put it into the gut of the quiet mouse okay. and it then started to behave like the other mouse exhibiting which, those symptoms exactly yeah. which um speaks volumes about how your gut influences your behavior mm. um and i think they're starting to run similar experiments um amongst humans now uh, and potentially stool transfers could be one way you could you know help to allay people of their anxiety for example which yeah yeah um next level <laughs> it is it is um fecal transplants are yeah. going to be a big thing so to all you out there who believe you have optimal stools you can be a donor yourself and uh <laughs> <laughs> might have to uh, go go visit joe rogan knock on his door and just uh you know while um while everyone's sitting down to dinner go to the toilet and see if i can uh, get some stools and all right i'm going off on a tangent but uh hey we can all be a little bit more rogan if we could all be a little bit more like him i think we would be a better place um so what else are we going to talk about today we're going to talk about uh purpose as well so you know nootropics naturopathy modern medicine whatever the case may be it can all help to make us a little bit better food exercise sleep and so on but my view on this and this echoes something that uh brad stolberg um author of the passion paradox and peak performance also said was uh purpose is the world's number one performance enhancer like Mm. you could be getting your your sleep and everything else but unless you're waking up with 
a reason for being um, a mission that you're working towards, you kind of just skate along. Um, it's kind of like what you said earlier where you're waking up with this fire in your That's belly. Yeah. But if you haven't got that, then you could be like, all your mark- biomarkers could be awesome. Pretty much. Yeah. But like, what are you going to... What are you going to do now that you're superhuman, for example? Are you going to jump in front of a train or to save someone? But you haven't. Where's your purpose, right? Mm. So, I mean, how does that play out in in your work, or how has that played out in your life? In yeah, well, um, I would say only in the last year or so, I've really started to hone in on what my purpose is and mm. um, what I love doing and what is really fulfilling for me. And it's quite a bit of a paradigm, but essentially, what I figured out was that. When I when I feel my happiest, it's when I'm giving to other people. It's not receiving. Mm-hmm. Like, I'll, let's say I receive a gift. I feel better giving a gift than receiving it or yep. giving knowledge than receiving knowledge. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and that goes back to my, um, my belief that it is criminal to withhold knowledge or um, wisdom from someone else and not be able to sort of pass that on and improve someone else's life because i guess that would be for me that's greedy that's like if if you know something and you can straight out help someone else with whatever that whatever their challenge is then just just do it do it Mm -hmm. from your heart because i mean things come back to you and you you'll be better off in the longer run and for your own mental health and for your own happiness yeah well i'm speaking on on behalf of myself of course I feel I feel amazing. Like the days where, and as I track my mood and my well being and stuff like that, mm. on the days where I've <clears throat> like stepped out of my own, how can I satisfy myself? How can I, you know, um, selfish tasks and things like that? The days when I'm selfless and when I'm really helping others and like connecting with other people mm. with whatever their challenge is. For me, that gives me an ultimate sense of value and contribution and purpose. Yeah. Um, And it's similar to that vibrational feeling, but it's a different, it's more of like, I'm so at peace with myself because I'm, I'm, I'm valued. Yeah. No, it's, it's absolutely huge. And uh, I think it was Israel Adesanya, the UFC fighter, I saw a video he posted recently where he was just sparring with some kids in some rural village in Africa or whatnot. And his caption was, I do it for the love, not the likes. Mm. Um, and even, you know, when I've received a message from someone randomly on, say, LinkedIn, uh, who has read a copy of my book or listened to my podcast and just you know, took the time to say, hey man, love your work, start my own business or it's inspired me to mm. um, be a better person or whatever the case may be. Like I could be having the most, you know, average day ever, but I get that one message and it just brightens my whole yeah. day and disposition up and I feel like I've made a difference in some way and then the rest of the day I'm like super positive. Yeah, yep. It's it's huge and I'm sure you get the same with, oh, with yeah. your work at the moment. Yeah. And it's becoming more and more frequent as well because yeah. like as I'm sharing more and more information on my Instagram and stuff mm. like that, I mean, I wake up every morning and I'll get a message saying, thank you so much for what you're doing. Like, yeah. you're, really, you're really helping me. You're really giving me some guidance or whatever. And I'm just like, well, uh, another day at the office, I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing because I love yeah. it. I yeah. absolutely love it. Yeah. And uh, it's been really cool to see your um, evolution uh, as a person and also as uh, an advocate in the space, uh, you know, obviously setting up ergogenic health and now you're... Uh, Instagram is blowing up every time I jump on there's like just hundreds of comments and you know sometimes thousands of likes and this is only the beginning as well I imagine it's going to get a hell of a lot bigger over the next couple of years and I'm really looking forward to seeing Mm. how that all plays out Um, one thing I I find is there's a lot of talk nowadays about the flow state I recently had um, Steve Brophy on the show who spent some time with Jamie Wheel over at the Redwood Forest in San Francisco and doing the flow certification course and you know I'm a big believer in flow Um, you mentioned it earlier you can you know, maybe get into flow for about four hours a day. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of explore as well, though, it was it's easy to look for sort of shallow experiences in life. And uh, one thing that Jamie Wheel talked about when he was on my show was, um, you know, give me something that's just going to knock me out. Because I find, and this was also in the Mind Gut Connection book where they talked about when you get into flow, when you have these deeply immersive experiences it actually improves your um 
your diversity in your gut. It makes you more positive. Wow. Um, and then you end up just feeling uh, like a higher being for hours, if not days to come. And so I find that if I have spent, say, three hours sitting down writing an article and I've been totally immersed in that, I will mm. get that feeling. Mm. Similarly, something else that will just knock me out is going out for a surf and just getting smashed by waves. Like, <laughs> I don't care if I don't catch any waves, but just being out there, especially mm. on a cold morning, um, the feeling you get from that is just like next level. Yeah. Um, it's it's better than any any pill that I've ever had, um, legal or otherwise. Um, but I guess that's essentially no different to a pill in the sense that it's stimulating a chemical re- reaction in your brain, whether it's dopamine mm. or something else. So something I know you're interested in is um, uh, dopamine enhancement. Mm. Um, talk to me about that and how can we get more dopamine in our lives? Sure, yeah. Um, so throughout my experimentations, I started to realize that uh compounds that would improve dopamine signaling in the brain and dopamine function they seem to really improve my motivational levels Mm -hmm. and my ability to be just focused um and i also recently have started learning that um most of us actually have too much serotonin Mm. and again this is one of those fallacies where we're led to believe that i mean this is not medical advice anyone but um essentially a lot of us actually have too much of it Mm. and um, strategies to lower serotonin can actually reduce anxiety for some people yeah can actually um it it can improve it can reduce adhd symptoms Mm -hmm. for some people um and strategies to basically optimize dopamine functioning i've never seen that not not successful in an individual Mm. like I've never seen someone say, no, nah, I don't feel good when they don't come in. Like dopamine is not about pleasure. No. It's the anticipation of pleasure. Yeah. Um, and things that can, um, and then reward comes into it as well. So um, chasing a reward mm-hmm. is driven by like dopamine. Yep. Um, it's not that straightforward though because there's uh, like dopamine signaling in the brain differs from region to region. Mm-hmm. And also... Um, dopamine receptor sites so that's where dopamine can bind to the receptor yeah that will have they'll play a tremendous role in how someone feels and behaves yeah with with dopamine is there i mean i find that if i do something once and i get that huge dopamine hit but then i do it again it's probably not as big and then the more i do it that dopamine hit kind of gets blunted somewhat Mm. that, that that response uh is there something in that to say that, well, you need to keep increasing the challenge or the intensity or something? Otherwise, you're just going to be chasing the dragon, if you will. It's sort of, uh, yeah, you're basically touching on that reward threshold. Yeah. Like it's constantly being bumped up and up and up. Yeah. So to achieve that same sort of spike, you need to do something riskier or something more uh, rewarding in a sense. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like plays out in relationships. People have the initial honeymoon yeah. period. They're like, this is amazing, just flirting. And then after a while, they're like, I hate this person. I can't see anything but negatives and all those positives that I once saw. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. And uh, I guess part of that is becoming more self-aware around how our brain actually works so that we don't sabotage you know, relationships and, and things, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so with... Like with that whole journey of optimizing dopamine, there's definitely a lot of nootropics that can support that. Yeah. Um, and it's definitely a space that I want to get into because uh, it's so far reaching beyond just simply like corporate workers, but even uh, athletes as well. Yeah. With, um, reducing fatigue and stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, there's a bunch of uh, biohacks and whatnot that I wanted to touch on with you today. We actually touched on quite a few. We talked about sleep and blue light. Uh, blue blockers essentially we talked about ice uh we've talked about dopamine and serotonin suppression uh lots of good stuff um one thing i noticed when i was over at your house recently was that you have an infrared sauna in your garage talk to me about that yeah so um i was very jealous by the way (laughs) uh you're more than welcome to come over and use it man like it's it's free um so essentially infrared saunas uh 
I would say possibly one of the most advantageous strategies to reduce toxin load on mm-hmm. the body. So without a doubt, we're all bombarded with either heavy metals, pesticides, glyphosate, yeah. and all sorts of toxins. And what people are not really familiar with is that they store in our fat tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the big excretion pathways for them is through the skin. And essentially, an infrared sauna promotes sweating. Yeah. Um, and there's an actually there's actually a protocol you can do. It's the nice and sauna protocol. So it's like vitamin B three, an infrared sauna, and what that does, the vitamin B three dilates the capillaries on your on your skin. Yeah. And um, it helps facilitate the removal of heavy metals and toxins and stuff like that. So, um, having said that, they're awesome for a lot of people. However. If somebody's very toxic, they'll feel horrible the next day. Like mm. they'll feel very lethargic and fatigued. Um, and that can strip out a lot of the electrolytes from the body. So you really do need to know how to use it to your advantage. And I actually also believe that less is more with sauna usage. Like mm-hmm. I only use it about once or twice a week. Yeah. Any more than that. And I'm just drained. Like what, 15 minutes or so? About 25 minutes 25, at about yep. 55 degrees Celsius. Yep. Um, and that's enough really yeah. uh, and the other thing is Dr. Um, Rhonda Patrick yep she's a big advocate for mm-hmm. sauna usage and same with Ben Greenfield um, and what I found is that it's better in the morning I always thought it was better in the evening like, right. but it actually ruins my sleep when I use it in the evening I'm gobsmacked I'm like I don't understand the mechanisms behind that's that that's interesting because I've, I've um, used saunas as a sleep aid okay. um, and some of the stuff I've read suggests that because you're increasing your core body temperature. Um, once you finish up with the sauna, you get into bed, your body is then working to decrease its core body temperature. And that is kind of like a calming, soothing effect. And I find that if I have a sauna, say 30 to 40 minutes before I go to sleep, like I am just out like a baby. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously, and this comes back to what you are saying earlier, modern healthcare um, oftentimes is looking at the average or the whole population rather than the individual. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and having said that though, with, uh, with sauna usage, it has some interesting properties in the brain for our endorphins. Mm. Um, and some of the chemicals that it releases, if you use it longer term, it's, I think it's, uh, a very useful tool to increase your stress tolerance levels. Mm -hmm. Um, and Beyond that, it can really help with cardiovascular function and yep. uh, many other things. It's just it's just another tool you can utilize. I think that, that that's fascinating to me, um, increasing your stress tolerance by having saunas so that you will essentially become more resilient in the face of all the adversity you will inevitably face in life, um, in work, mm. um, in everything else. Um, and that's something that uh, I'm sure you partake in, uh, which... Uh, I, particularly during the winter uh, obviously there's a lot of physiological benefits to it but one of the big benefits for me is just discipline and willing yourself to do something that you don't really I don't really want to do it it's freaking cold um, you know now in Melbourne in the morning it's like sub well it's single digit temperatures and the pipes are freezing and mm. You don't want to do it, but you do it anyway. And once you're in there, you actually feel amazing afterwards. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Awesome. Um, but before you jump in, it's like, I don't want to do this. But that's that's essentially life. Like you're going to have to do a lot of things you don't want to do if you want to get to where you want to where you want to go. Yeah. And that is providing you've got big goals. Otherwise, you just live a life of comfort and watch Netflix and um, be really mediocre. But that's essentially not the profile of the person that listens to Future Squared. <laughs> Yeah, so cold showers, what, is, what are some of the benefits to them? Well, cold physiologically. showers, physiologically. So um, one of the most renowned features of cold showers is that they can increase norepinephrine and noradrenaline mm-hmm. levels, yep. which emit like acutely. So straight after you finish for about an hour or two, wow. your norepinephrine levels shoot up by like 500%. What does that do for us? Oh, well, norepinephrine is a uh, precursor to adrenaline and um, well, norepinephrine in and of itself is a neurotransmitter. Mm-hmm. So that plays a role in sustained focus, um, arousal, like just a bit like a, how coffee affects you. Yeah. Um, it can it can just boost alertness and things like that. Yeah. 
Um, so with neurotransmitters, like if we have not got, say, enough uh, neuropinephrine, we may not think and make decisions as well as we normally would. Uh, is that what we're kind of talking about there? Or um, <clears throat> Well, understanding the pathway. So Yeah, like pregnenolone is kind of like the, the yeah. mother ho- hormone. Is that yeah. what they call it? And yep. And testosterone branches off that. Drive and, down, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, with the norepinephrine... Um, it's more of the arousal slash um, alertness and focus right. aspect, yeah. similar to dopamine. Well, funnily enough, the norepinephrine is a, a downstream metabolite of dopamine. So does that mean if you don't get enough dopamine, you don't get... That's yes. what I was saying before. Right. So like, that's why I'd rather work on that, that building block there. That's probably something people should familiarize themselves with those pathways. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and there's another... Well, that, that pathway starts from our food. Mm. And this is really cool. It's like understanding that our food is the building, is the very, very beginning building blocks and precursors. Yeah. So essentially the amino acid tyrosine, mm. L-tyrosine, which we find in steak and chicken and nuts and stuff, um, that then goes into, um, it converts into L-dopa which is the precursor to dopamine. And then from dopamine, he has all the downstream effects into norepinephrine and then adrenaline. Um, so people can use L-tyrosine and mm-hmm. it's often used as a supplement um, in nootropic stacks. And it's something I've worked with before and experienced. Uh, and it's quite good. It's quite good yeah. for as a baseline for some people. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. And I guess when it comes to um, food, there's a whole movement uh, around fat nowadays um you know for so many years uh, we were told that fat is bad for you stay away um mm. and there are many who believe that this was just a byproduct of the food lobby uh pushing for that and essentially marketing all their high sugar high fructose high glucose foods as fat free um despite the fact that they were notoriously bad for you and just full of sugar um I, wh- where do you sit in terms of fat um, so I've never, I've never fully explored and experimented with the ketogenic diet mm-hmm. just simply because I'm always training. Because you're half Italian and half Lebanese and you love your carbs? <laughs> yeah, pretty much actually. <laughs> yeah, I love my, love my pasta. Um, having said that though, I think some people respond really well to it. Yeah. And um, let's, I mean, let's uncover why. I yeah. think the number one reason for a lot of people is that they're no longer experiencing those blood sugar spikes mm-hmm. throughout the day, which they previously were once getting. Yeah. And um, so they're just crashing at like two p.m. for example. Yeah, yeah. and um, and even even when you sleep, having good blood sugar control is really important mm-hmm. for because you wake up if you wake up multiple times throughout the night. There's a good chance that you're going hypoglycemic mm-hmm. and when you go low when you have low blood sugar your body secretes cortisol yeah to get it back up because cortisol is a glucocorticoid yep. and it gets it back up mm-hmm. um but the ketogenic diet is there's a lot of research um in the field of like epilepsy um and that's got to do with the effects of like a high fat diet on gaba production which is another neurotransmitter like dopamine like serotonin which is actually the brake pedal. Mm-hmm. So what that does is um, it's inhibitory. So it's a little bit like how alcohol affects a lot of people. Yeah, it makes them feel like they're in, they're they no longer have any inhibitions, and it sort of just slows them down a little bit, helps them feel relaxed and and sort of calm. And a lot of people are craving that because they're either too anxious or just too on edge. Yeah. And the ketogenic diet for a lot of people. Um, makes them feel amazing like you've you've exp- I've, I've experimented with it um i definitely felt clearer yeah and I, I felt like i had a heightened sense of focus and awareness mm. um nowadays I, i'm not on a ketogenic diet as such but i would say that i derive the vast majority of my calories from protein and fat and maybe only about 10 percent from from carbs at the moment on average um but it's not up at like 70 to 80% fat, which is essentially the definition of you know keto. keto. Um, it's probably 40, 45%. Um, 
But one thing I do practice now is the 16 hour a day intermittent fast. Mm. And this is something I heard, I think it was Ben Greenfield who spoke about this. Um, it's not necessarily the fast that is a is why a lot of people feel better. It's caloric uh, reduction. Restriction. Restriction, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Because your body obviously has to work less to process all these calories and, and whatnot coming through. And also in terms of the, the microbiome, you're giving it time to just do its thing. You're not just constantly throwing shit down there. Um, is caloric restriction more so one of the reasons why people um, say that they derive a lot of benefit from say intermittent fasting or i think that's definitely one element yep um, i'm sure there's many like with anything in, in these murky waters there's lots yeah, of elements yep. yeah yeah um but i definitely think that when you take a break from food um yep. your body no longer has to like sort of process that and anytime you're you ingest food it's mm. gonna act as your your body needs to learn how to detoxify that as well. So there's going to be waste products to that. Yep. Um, so I think as part of like a, uh, an intermittent fasting protocol and caloric restriction diet, um, the benefits are, are far reaching. Like mm. there are effects on the gut microbiome. Um, it gives your liver a chance to start clearing out all the shit that, that's in there, yeah. and the toxins and stuff. So um, yeah, I mean... And also growth hormone goes up with fasting. You're pretty yeah, yeah, yeah. So I used to uh, be one of these guys who I train. So I'd you know, do a strength training session in the gym and then immediately like within 30 minutes, I'd be smashing you know, simple carbs and my protein shake and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Nowadays, like I trained this morning. Uh, it's now, what's the time now? It's like 9.36 a.m. I finished my workout this morning at about 7 a.m. and it was... Uh, reasonably heavy strength training workout i haven't eaten i've just had some black coffee um but it like like you said it not eating within say a couple of hours of a workout it can boost um that testosterone mm. level essentially at least that's what i have understood from my uh content consumption in this space yeah yeah pretty much and um the growth hormone surge occurs and actually linking it back to the sauna before mm. sauna usage is another great strategy for people to increase their growth hormone levels as yeah, well yeah um yeah and i mean following actually i'm about to do a post on how it's better to avoid cold showers mm -hmm. immediately after a workout um because that can sort of blunt some of the muscle gains and the strength yeah i also read that you shouldn't have a cold shower after a strength training session because it can have a yeah a blunting effect mm. whereas you should have a, a hot shower after a strength training session and if you want to have a cold shower you need to wait a couple of hours yep. before you do so mm. yeah which for a long time i was having the cold showers after a, <laughs> a big workout and i think it's been probably been about a year now when i've stopped doing that and i'll only have the cold shower if i've done kind of like a less more like a functional training workout in the morning where it's not about muscle growth. It's just about functional fitness and whatnot. And then I'll have a cold shower, but yeah. You still got gains regardless, mate. So I wouldn't be yeah. worrying. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. <laughs> I think I've pretty much been on the same level for about 10 years now. So it's not really gains. It just maintains. Um, let's, let's touch on a couple of other things. Then we'll probably wrap this bad boy up. GDAs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually have not come across them. So when I googled what gdas were when i discovered them on your website i was like this sounds really interesting and yeah. i'm sure our audience will think the same yeah so um in the last few months i've been really exploring ways that we can improve insulin sensitivity mm -hmm. um for those of you for those who want to continue to eat like a, a pretty balanced diet with carbohydrates um gdas can be used so essentially they're glucose disposal agents um, and what they do is they help your body utilize sugar mm -hmm. and they help your body use that carbohydrate into where it needs to go. So like essentially they either mimic insulin yep. or they enhance insulin's actions in the body. So a strategic, uh, a way to utilize them is you can essentially use a gda anytime you're having let's say like a really high carb meal mm -hmm. to help your body use that as a instead of it just lingering in the bloodstream which is detrimental like yeah. high blood sugar levels causes all sorts of things um 
GDAs help your body shuttle that sugar straight into the muscle cell. Um, and a lot of bodybuilders and athletes are starting to grasp onto it now and use it like about 35 to 40 minutes before their workout. Wow. And they get better pumps, better performance. Um, and in terms of longevity, like if we care about a long, like longevity, mm. GDAs, I think for a lot of people can be useful because we are starting to understand that <clears throat> like having elevated insulin levels um, like, like being insulin resistant can lead to heart disease and all sorts of um, health issues down the track. So GDA is uh, one of those strategies you can implement to, you know, increase your insulin sensitivity, um, lower blood sugar levels. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess for a lot of people it can make them feel less guilty about yep. eating a high, let's say they have a big pasta meal or whatever. Mm -hmm have a gda with that and your your body will be able to use that carbohydrate better than mm. without it interesting just mm. on pasta and having you know, carby meals one thing i read a few years ago i'm not sure if there's any truth to it was that if you squeeze like citrus or a lemon over your rice or pasta or whatnot it can decrease the uh, GI sort of profile and, and your body will process it slower rather than like a simple carb in one big hit. Is that something you've come across or is it pseudoscience? <laughs> I've been doing it for, for years just because. Well, you're doing it for like, it's going to have beneficial effects elsewhere. So using yeah. a lemon, it's going to help with bile secretion. Okay. And bile is needed for um, emulsifying and digesting fats. Uh -huh. So you're getting the benefit in that area. I'm not sure about slow, <laughs> like lowering the GI, but... Um, <laughs> If it tastes better, then go ahead. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily taste better, but uh, it, it makes me feel less guilty, which I think is why most people do a lot of things. Hey, I'll, I'll uh, have the Diet Coke with my Big Mac and fries because <laughs> it makes me feel less guilty. Mm. Um, never mind the... Um, what, what's all the... Uh, the artificial sweeteners they use. Apparently, they are just as bad for you as sugar if not worse in, in mm. many cases that's something that also came out of this mind gut connection book um, in terms of uh, the impact on your microbiome as well as uh, neurodegenerative uh, impacts as well mm. um, which people just guzzle them down thinking oh it's a diet coke it's all good I can have several of these a day yeah. which is pretty scary um, fantastic well we have pretty much talked about all of the new tropic hacks that I wanted to talk about or the, all the biohacks that I wanted to talk about rather. Um, one thing we should probably stress is that, like you said earlier, we are not against modern healthcare. I'm definitely not. I think it's about uh, supplementing modern healthcare with uh, naturopathy and, and a holistic view to things. Um, and again, working with, because in any profession, you have good and you have not so good. And I find that amongst GPs, you have a lot who perhaps just haven't really kept up to date with anything, aren't genuinely motivated by their line of work. And in the world of uh, naturopathy, you have people like yourself who are just like constantly like trying to learn and update their worldview and apply that and share that knowledge with, with your audience, which I think is awesome. Um, of course, with anything, it's about being somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. taking the good from world a taking the good the good from world b and again i think if if you look at who was it michael Shermer, who was on my show a little while ago uh, alerted me to the fact that 50 percent of this of the studies in the social sciences for example can't be replicated so all we know is what is most right right now based on the evidence that we've collected based on how we've processed it based on um what we're testing for but there is so much more we don't know and it's just about trying things and testing things and seeing what works for you um, and not holding anything as you know as a dogma or whatnot and I know that's one of your values over at yeah. ergogenic health is that you know non-dogmatic mm. you know, and and strong opinions maybe but weakly held and if new evidence comes along to uh, falsify what I believe or what you believe then you'll essentially change your mind on that and i think that's such a key philosophy that applies not only in this space but in in life in general yeah pretty much man and the um one one of my mottos is to question everything yeah you know? don't take not even what i've said today don't take my word as like gospel but go ahead do the research challenge what i've said mm -hmm. and um because i do that to myself every day yeah like whatever i research i'm always 
I actually do a complete 180 and think mm. the complete opposite. Like if I'm reading a research what's paper. It's counterfactual here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. like, well, what's the, am I completely off track? And then I'll think of it from the complete other side. Mm. And it's actually happened to me a lot this year where I've, uh, I've done a complete 180 and changed my opinion on a particular topic just by challenging what I previously thought. Um, it's just definitely something I, I encourage a lot of people to yeah. do and um, to really, it does not matter what something says or information you read. I, I honestly do believe that it's how it affects you and mm. you need to take control. Like no one else is going to do that for you. It's up to you yep. and whatever works for you works for you. And um, even all, if it's a placebo, as long as you yeah. Um, and um yeah i guess for a lot of people it's if they feel like something works for them go ahead do it i'm not going to question it so um mm -hmm. yeah i'm a big promo uh, proponent of um taking full control of your health yeah 100 yeah. percent. and uh for people who are interested in having their views challenged there's a really cool site i came across recently called changeofview.com where you can basically post your opinion on something and then you invite people to change your opinion so but the way it works is it's not like if i was posting something on reddit and then you have had people just tearing the stuff down <laughs> it's done so in a uh very deliberate way where it supports healthy discourse and it says yeah. well i understand your argument but have you thought about xyz mm. um and i recently put something up posted something where i said you can't trust your intuition because uh, it is essentially a byproduct of um, evolution genetics upbringing infancy past experience like there's so many things and if i'm going to trust my intuition when i'm making a decision about something that i've never made a decision about before like for example i'm choosing to invest in i don't know uh wheat or something like that but i know nothing about agriculture then trusting my intuition probably isn't a good thing right But then I had people come back and say, well, it depends what you're making a decision about. Mm. depends how much time you have to make a decision. And so you start to expand your thinking. You're like, yes, you, perhaps you can trust your intuition if you only have one minute to make a decision. And perhaps you've made a decision in this space before. Uh, you haven't got time to exercise reason and logic and everything else. So again, there's kind of, I found it very um very rewarding and even because i write a lot of content and work on books and things of that persuasion i can see myself using it a lot more going forward whenever i am publishing something which is somewhat opinionated i'll say okay well change my view and then you can incorporate that into your writing and provide mm -hmm. people with a more sort of a grounded sort of holistic view of the world rather than hey here's what i think based on whatever i've observed but there's all these other stuff i haven't observed that hasn't influenced my opinion so i think it's just worthwhile because you know yep we only know so much and the, lo the, the worst thing you want to be is you know that that horse that gets led to water but refuses to drink essentially yeah. uh, i think we can all we can all drink the water every now and again as long as it's not kool-aid um yeah. <laughs> so let's wrap up with with the three question lightning around lucas this has been a lot of fun question number one and i'll change this slightly if you could work with any biohacker wellness coach personality in this space who would it be and why geez that's a tough question hmm i would say right now probably ben greenfield yeah um just because i mean he's walked the path mm -hmm. and um he goes he dives deep and he experiments a lot more than me mm. um and he's also a wealth of knowledge and he And he does share it as well. Yeah. And he's just got a, a really strong reputation in my eyes. Like yeah. He's just got a lot of personal experience in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. um, well, he's also competed in a number of different, I think he's triathlons and mm. all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Ben Greenfield's, uh, yeah, one of my, one of my idols. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was fortunate enough to have him on the Future Squared podcast about a hundred or so episodes ago, so people can revisit that conversation. Mm. Um, speaking of icing uh, gonads and things of that persuasion, I think <laughs> Ben was on the Joe Rogan show talking about injecting uh, his penis. Uh, I don't remember exactly why he was doing that, but with stem cells. With stem cells, yes, yeah. yes. What what would the benefit be of doing that? <laughs> while we're on it. <laughs> Um, okay, so the stem cell therapy is basically they're like 
uh, precursor cells to any other cell within uh-huh. the body. And um, I think as you age, those cells decline mm-hmm. and his Ben's objective is to inject them into his penis for for penis gains, I guess. So Wow. Um, and performance. So, I mean, that's... It's definitely a pretty a pretty hot topic and not something I'm very like keen on experimenting <laughs> with at the moment. I've got other because you're still young. <laughs> so <laughs> Ben's in his what late thirties now. He's yeah. starting to think about these things. <laughs> got other priorities at the moment. <laughs> um, Fair enough. But uh, well, we'll spare you from having to uh, talk any further about that. <laughs> uh, question number two: If you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, and it might be a Ben Greenfield, who would it be, and what would you ask? Hmm. I would say Matt Legg from, he's a naturopath from Brisbane. Yep. Who I've been following for a long time. He's actually the founder of, AT, uh, the lead formulator at ATP Science. Mm-hmm. Um, if there was a, what, a single question I had to ask him, possibly, how do you bring a product to market? Because that's mm. something I'm working on right now. Yeah. Um, should be asking me that question <laughs> <laughs> yeah well for the for the the non-business side of things more like the yep. technicalities of the product because i am working on a product right now as we speak and um yeah i'm just i'd like to know a bit more about is there anything that. you can share about that product or is it still early early days i mean i've just signed an nda so it's okay. sort of a bit a bit hot yep. at the moment but um yeah i'll be sharing with sharing that with you soon also yeah. look forward to it um and lucky last i mean we've touched on a bunch of uh biohacks and whatnot today uh, but i always ask people what sort of rituals or routines do you have to stay on top of your game do you have any that you kind of partake in on a daily basis without fail yeah so the biggest one for me um i document and i record everything like i'll like sort of audit myself Mm -hmm. and like just keep i'll just track my mood my uh, my energy levels my sleep and stuff like that uh it's it's a prerequisite for me like like you said before uh you need that to be able to make change Mm. and um just just real quick on that um are there any like key markers that people biomarkers that people should be tracking well i mean if they don't have if they can't get a blood test Mm -hmm. then I still think keeping track of like how they sleep subjectively mm-hmm. without using an aura ring, like they can still gain a lot from that, like mm-hmm. how they feel their energy levels, um, their focus at work or whatever, just self-tracking. And then from that, then you can sort of explore like nootropics and then infuse them into your routine and then yeah. see what's working well for you. And I'm pretty confident that there's a good chance... Uh, that dopamine dopamine boosting compounds will support them on their mission. Yeah. I'm pretty confident in saying that. He's, he's very confident, <laughs> folks. He's very confident. Well, if people enjoy this conversation, which I'm sure they did. They can get more of you over at ergogenichealth.com. Uh, you're on Facebook. Dot au. Dot com dot au. <laughs> uh, you're on Facebook and Instagram at ergogenic underscore health as well. Are there any parting things you want to leave our audience with? Um. Uh, at the end of this, I'd say possibly just anything that can improve self-awareness and mm-hmm. engaging in self-awareness is is key. Yeah. Is key. 100%. Well, thank you so much, Lucas. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Stevie. Good luck with everything. And I look forward to hearing about this very top secret compound very, very soon. <laughs> See you, folks. See you, guys.
we're all helpful at seeing it and shaping my view. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. definitely check that out. Yeah, especially in your field, I think yeah. that would be really helpful. Because um, I think, yeah, that's that's what differentiates people in this field is being open-minded and, mm. and not being dogmatic. I think it's because people question, especially smart yeah. people, they're like, oh, this guy. Yeah, that's why I try to sort of keep it open in this sort of, like, I mean, I could have gone down extreme opinionated yeah, like, yeah. views but then I was like I'm cautious of if I was talking to like um, if I was lecturing for like a bodybuilder yeah. or something I'd go really deep yeah. but I was like you could probably tell I was like holding off a bit yeah 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 no, but I hope it was enough for no that. that was enough yeah and um, I think we did go a little bit deeper I probably just needed to uh, be like alright what's that yeah what does that mean in layman's terms yeah yeah, yeah. I know I know yeah. that's that's something I'm working on yeah that's like uh, I did a mobility class recently at Gym, focus fitness in Europe and um, yeah. the PT was it, was it was a good research like it was like four weeks but he fucking used all these words about like tendons and shit and acronyms no and stuff that no one knows and he just kind of just worked through it from now and yeah. always have to be like you know what's, what's up what's up what's up yeah I think it was good though regardless it was yeah. just good to get something going and yeah 100% um, I think we did what was it a good hour or so yeah hour and 16 minutes cool. and that product idea that I was talking about just at the end yeah exactly um, yeah I'll fill you in soon but um, you remember Canal? 